session I am moderating and I am afraid of moderating it because the person sitting next to me, <laughs> I don't know because he, he himself is a Vishwa Guru or Vishwa Shastri or whatever. I can't name him because he wears so many caps. He is a Hindu, Indra Samaj Maharaj, he is a Hindu Tuvadi, he is an economist, he is a politician. I don't know what is he, what role he is performing now. So I'm, it's very difficult to ask any question. Nobody, I don't have to interview Dr. Swami because uh, he's the only genuine economist left in the country, I think, who speaks the first language. He's not a diplomatic economist. <laughs> and he's also the only politician who calls spade a spade. There's no politician who, he's not a hypocrite. That is one thing about him. Number two, you never know, he can, when can he turn from a friend to a foe? You never know that also. Because he decides his own terms of engagement. He turn, his terms of engagement decides his friendship. Tomorrow, is, today is my friend. Tomorrow he will be my enemy if he does, don't work according to each other. <laughs> so it is a very unpredictable personality and which is good. Therefore, he looks very young. And biographically, he may not be that young, but mentally and physically, <laughs> he is very young now. And uh, we have called him today. The topic is what they call... Um, uh, global high table, can India be a Vishwaguru? Because the new terms are being created these days, every day, as the panel were discussing. We are a Vishwaguru or Vishwaneta or whatever we are being defined. But one thing is, which I know Dr. Swami will give a different interpretation to that. India is definitely much better in global sense, our recognition much better than it was many years ago. India is on the high table. There's no doubt about it. I'm not saying about individuals because India as a country, it definitely, we are all proud of. India today is much more better recognized all throughout the world, whether the economy as a political stability or financial stability. So I would like to know from Mr. Swami, Dr. Swami now, because he was one of the most admired person of Prime Minister Modi. I don't know who discovered whom, I don't know yet whether he discovered Prime Minister Modi or Modi discovered him, brought him into party and made him the rise of amber. So are we part of the global high table where we can dictate terms now? When I mean, Russia is fighting America, China is fighting America, every fight because he knows Americans very well, he knows China very well, he knows India much more than all of them together. So he's the master of all. I won't call the jack of anything, anything but he's the master of all and jack of none. So let me ask him, Dr. Swami, what do you think is happening in India in terms of is Hindutva going forward? In terms of globally, are Bharat going forward? So there is a Bharat becoming the world global leader and India Indianized becoming Bharatiya. Over to you. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Prabhu. I'm Swami and you're Prabhu. Not bad. Uh, <coughs> I've known him since he was a college student and uh, he hasn't changed a bit. Um, and uh, today, uh, for the first time, I'm having him moderate what I'm saying. Um, how much time do I have? All right. All right. I'll, I'll address the topic, can India be a Vishwaguru? And then we can take on questions afterwards. It's okay. I mean, it's fine. Um, first of all, the definition of Vishwaguru. It is a mindset. It's not an individual. Guru is usually an individual. But it's a mindset which uh, of a country which makes others accept our values and practices. We may say Vas Vasudeva Kutumbakam, but the fact is that we would like to see that those areas and those dimensions which we hold dear from our cultural past, our civilization, so on, are accepted abroad and that India is recognized as a, as, a, as a country which can contribute to a better world. So that is the concept of Vishwaguru. 
And I would say that we were a Vishu Guru from time immemorial. I can't say how far back I can go. Even Ramayan is at least uh, 9,000 years ago. So therefore, uh, uh, I would say, however, that role was terminated finally in the 12th century when uh, in uh, uh, Muhammad Ghori unfurled uh, his flag uh, in Delhi. So therefore, after that, we have been in a series of attacks, invasions, looting, and so on till 1947. Now, after 1947, we, were, we did not pick up this concept of Vishwaguru, that India has many things to contribute, and again, it must try to establish its position in the world. There were people who wrote in as late as 1936, who put the Vishwaguru uh, feature about India, in international conferences. In 1936, Harvard University became 300 years old. It was started in 1636, and it became, in 1936, 300 years old. They called scholars from all over the world, and they called a very famous poet and scholar and the president of the Peking University, or Beijing University, Hu Shi, Dr. Hu Shi, to, uh, to Harvard, to the conference, and asked him to speak on a topic of his choice. And the subject he spoke, and which is printed now, as, is available in print uh, of, of, as a conference volume, the, uh, topic, the, uh, the title he gave was The Indianization of China, a case of peaceful borrowing uh, for centuries. Now, this is something which surprises everybody because we, have, we don't know our history. And uh, the history that uh, we got taught in schools were designed by the British on Macaulay's principles. And so we have no idea what influence we wielded all over the world. When people today go to Cambodia, Vietnam, Laos, uh, Indonesia, they're surprised to see temples of, uh, of uh, India with the Indian, uh, with Hindu gods and worship taking place, pujas taking place because they were never told to look east. We were all told to look west and feel inferior to that west. That was the uh, situation that we were left with in 1947. So I would say, first of all, when we say Vishwaguru, we have to change our educational curriculum to the point where the true facts come out. There is a lot of falsehood which has been put out, which divides us. This Aryan Dravidian theory is the most bogus theory that has ever been invented. And it has been completely negated by, uh, by the... Uh, um, uh, the studies that have been done uh, in, uh, in testing your uh, biological origins. And now there have been journals which have come out which say that all Indians from north to south, east to west, have the same DNA. And there is no such thing as a, there was an invasion. First the Dravidians came from somewhere, and then afterwards the Aryans came from somewhere. In fact, uh, if you trace the word Dravidian, it can be traced to Adi Shankara, who went around, went from South India to North India, persuading people to give up uh, Buddhism and return back to Hinduism. And in, in his case, when he was in Bihar, he was asked who he was. He said, I'm Dravida Shishu. And Shishu means, of course, uh, a child. But uh, Dravida, he explained, is where the three oceans meet, which is Arabian Sea, uh, Bay of Bengal, and the Indian Ocean. And he said that portion is Dravida, Travid, as he explained. So the word Dravida comes 
not as a, a question of race, but as a uh, as a uh, as a regional uh, that is South India. Unfortunately, it has been foisted on the Indian people, and a section now think that they are race apart because they are Dravidas. And I don't think that uh, uh, with this kind of brainwashing that has taken place in the past, we can be a Vishwa Guru. So we have to get at least to learn what the true history of India is. So I would say today the question will be, can we regain the Vishwa Guru status that we had in the past and what we have to do for that. Now, there are today indications that the international opinion of India is changing. And, uh, and they are beginning to give India a, not only the current state in terms of its current status, but India is also being, uh, its history is being revised in a very slow manner, but it is being revised. I noticed that as far back as 2009, the editor of the Newsweek magazine, which is an American magazine, had an editorial article in Newsweek saying, headed, we are all, we all, we are all becoming Hindus. And I was very surprised, you can get it in Google if you go and uh, uh, type, uh, her name was, the editor's name was uh, Ann Miller and uh, say Newsweek 2009, and you'll, you'll get a, a, the, from the internet the article. And what she says is that there are so many concepts of Hinduism that we have now begun to ex accept. The one that caused most uh, furor was when she said, the Hindus burn their dead, uh, dead uh, you know, uh, people who die, they burn them. That's the most scientific thing to do. Because their, the their theology says that a body is only like, a, like, like the cloth you put on your body. And the soul is something that travels without the body. So therefore, she says, look at uh, when you come from the uh, New York airport and come to, the, to New York City, how much, how many, you know, acres and acres of land is now under, uh, you know, uh, under uh, uh, the graves that have been put in. So the land which is being, should be used for other purposes, housing uh, and other such things, is being used for graves. And these graves are very old. People come even now, generation after generation. But the truth is that that is, a, a, is, is not a concept that is scientifically viable. And therefore she says, this is a Hindu concept and we should accept it. Like that she is given, that began in 2009. <clears throat> now again, if you go to Google and type St. James School, London and Sanskrit, you will find something, you will find very, uh, if you have not done it, you have not seen it, then you will find this, what I'm telling you is unbelievable. In that is a news item which, uh, which uh, in, is an interview with the principal of a very prestigious school in London called St. James School. And uh, the principal is asked this question, why is it that you require children of the ages of six? And it's an all white school. It says, all the, uh, why do you require children of ages six to 11 every morning for half an hour to recite Sanskrit shlokas? Not only they recited Sanskrit shlokas every morning in school, but just now when uh, uh, Prince Charles was, uh, Prince Charles was coronated, there was a, a group from the, the same school which recited Sanskrit shlokas uh, during his coronation. Which, uh, I don't know how many of you were able to see it in the, in the media, but I'm sure that if you had seen it at, uh, continuously, you would have seen that too. Now, the principal is asked, why are you doing this? He says, I have come to conclusion in, after my study that if uh, Sanskrit shlokas are recited by children of the ages of 6 to 11, uh, uh, you know, every morning, then their brain development is much better than the brain development of other children who don't go through this. This is something which, again, you should uh, look at. 
then again uh, if you go to google again <laughs> you'll be able to find that the national uh, uh, the nasa as it's called national aeronautics and space agency of the united states has a journal called artificial intelligence and in artificial intelligence uh, right now the main thing that is worrying scholars is how to store knowledge uh, in a computer because ultimately the uh, uh, the robot that you produce is based on a computer and that computer then recalls all this information that has been fed into it so he says it's become very important a subject to find out how to store knowledge in a computer for a, for a, a robot in artificial intelligence and the author comes to the conclusion that it is very difficult to uh, insert knowledge with english uh, particularly uh, oral because if you while you are speaking you will say put and that is p u t and then you will say but but that is b u t also so you should say but also instead of put uh, but so therefore english is not appropriate he goes through a series of language and then finally says there is only one language which is computer uh, savvy and which can, we can use for artificial intelligence to store knowledge in a computer and that is sanskrit and therefore they have begun this teaching of sanskrit in in nasa uh, in the united states and there are many other places also now sanskrit being germany is uh, uh, teaching sanskrit in a very big way so only in india that we think sanskrit is something of the past and it's a, it's, a, it's something that we should we should be looking forward and so on but sanskrit words are there in every language of india and even in tamil about 40% of the words are in sanskrit i once had a discussion with uh, uh, with mr karuna nidhi whom i knew quite well and uh, he was very very much uh, a supporter of uh, of the uh, ancient uh, tamil that is there which is he said superior to sanskrit then i said why are there so many sanskrit words in in, in tamil and he said no no there are none so i said let me give you a name first of all your name karuna nidhi itself is sanskrit karuna and nidhi now he didn't know that so i made him wise to that then then i told him that you uh, you call the election symbol as chinnam the sanskrit word for uh, uh, symbol is chin from chin it becomes chinnam chinnam then uh, it, his uh, symbol is described as Udayan Suryan, that means, you know, rising sun. Now, Uday is Sanskrit, so Surya is Sanskrit, and Tamil has borrowed it. There are 40, uh, 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 40 percent of the words in Sanskrit. If you go through a dictionary and start tabulating, you'll find 40 percent of the words are Sanskrit. So, the people here who oppose Sanskrit, they really don't know their heritage. So, it doesn't matter uh, some people are preferred to have names like stalin which is not an indian name but a russian name <laughs> now uh, so i i would say that the question is uh, artificial intelligence itself shows this then we have acceptance of number of practices of hinduism which has been accepted in the west and is widely used yoga for example you can go to any town in America, you'll find a yoga center. And uh, they don't hide it, the fact that it's, uh, it's come from India. They, they uh, teach uh, pranayam. Lot of people now today in the medical uh, uh, schools are taught the concept of karma and how it affects uh, results for you. And uh, Ayurveda is also another uh, thing which is gaining strength. So I, I would say the indications are today that India has become, if not very strongly, but at least it's been recognized that it is a, a country which can be a leader for us in a field. I would say, therefore, that uh, what is it that we in India should do to become a Vishwaguru? 
I mean, I'm not giving speeches, and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not concerned about the Prime Minister talking about Vishwa Guru, uh, because he's neither Vishwa nor Guru. Uh, so therefore, I, I'm not in, the, in, in that situation where I have to praise him. I know him very well. We, we go on issues, we fight on issues, and I was a democratic party, and people keep asking me, like the, the, this gentleman here, why you haven't been expelled from BJP yet? So I tell him, it's a democratic party, and you're not used to democratic parties, I think. Uh, so therefore, in issues, there can be differences. And I would say there's a very strong difference in, with me and Mr. Modi on the question of the economy. Indian economy can grow at 10% per year for at least 15 years. And that's enough to make it a developed country. We have, during Narsimha Rao's period, achieved up to 8%. And after that, 7%, 6% has been very common. And therefore, I think what we, if you want to be a Vishwa Guru, then you have to demonstrate a country which was totally destructed by imperialism and, and Islamic invasions can become a developed country in a short period without a regimenting the society, with democracy, with differences, with the disagreements. So, therefore, I would say the first thing we have to do is go at 10% per year. There are consequences for that. How much investment would be required? How would you get the investment? Then, most of all, I must tell you that every country which has grown very fast, like the Western countries, they have not grown because they put in a lot of investment. Investment is a small part of economic growth. What is the main part is what we call as innovations, new methods of doing things. Locomotive in, uh, in, uh, in, in, the, in the 19th century for Britain. And then thereafter wireless, thereafter uh, steel uh, furnaces, so thereafter um, uh, aeroplanes, uh, computers, and now we are now reaching this cyber situation. So these innovations are the ones that will make the difference. For a country like India, to be fighting about water between, say, Tamil Nadu and Karnataka is really silly. There's plenty of water. You can desalinate the sea water and give enough water to both uh, uh, Tamil Nadu and, and uh, Karnataka uh, because, uh, by that process. The Israelis are doing that when they have no rivers. All these Arabian countries clandestinely accept Israeli technology for desalination of seawater. So the, these, these scientific achievements uh, are some things that you must, uh, uh, you must start you know, in developing, encouraging, uh, rewarding, you know, people should not, shouldn't go to America to get, uh, to get a good job as, as a scientist. It, it, this whole software in, in computers, in, electro, in, uh, in cyber warfare, everything in the software. Indians were the, the earliest uh, leaders in it. And then, of course, the rest of the world uh, took it. We need also a very strong army. We are the largest population in the world. We have just two weeks ago overtaken China, at least in one thing we have overtaken China, our population. Uh, and uh, such a large population, 1.4 billion people, I think we should have a very, very strong uh, uh, military and if necessary make the, necess the right kind of alliances. We have been invaded by China. China has crossed over the LAC, which is a mutually agreed line in 1996, that uh, before we will start talking about our differences and the land that is in each other's possession, but for the time being, we shall maintain peace by drawing an artificial line called the LAC, the line of actual control. But China has crossed that, violating an agreement, and have occupied as uh, now slowly it's coming out, uh, occupied a vast amount of land in Ladakh, a, a big portion of land in, uh, in Arunachal, and we have to respond to it if you want to be a Vishwa Guru. You cannot, be, you cannot pretend that the Chinese have not come uh, and uh, nobody has come, all these things to keep the people cool. 
you have to tell the people this has happened and we may take one year, two years, ten years, but we must eject the Chinese by military means uh, and that is the only way we can emerge as a Vishwaguru. So this is the second thing. F uh, the finally, I would I, I like to say that the most important thing ultimately, as you can see, is the intelligence. But what do you mean by intelligence? It's not cognitive intelligence only. Cognitive intelligence is what you learn in schools, colleges, and so on. And it gives you a skill. But that is the only one part of it. Our ancient, uh, 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 you know, gurus and uh, sadhus, sannyasis, saints, they all devised six different types of uh, intelligence. One is called emotional intelligence, the art of arguing, the art of putting across a point of view without annoying the other side, or the art of putting your words in such a way that the man is provoked to think uh, in a new way. So this emotional intelligence, the first one is cognitive intelligence, what you learn in your school college. The second thing is emotional intelligence. The third thing is social intelligence. For example, if you build a factory and it blows smoke into the air uh, uh, and then uh, all the people get uh, affected by it and uh, you know, they, they suffer diseases and so on, that is something which uh, is very dangerous. So you must have an intelligence that when you are permitting the society to industrialize, or uh, make progress in, uh, in the economy, you must ensure that it does not adversely affect the environment and the people and so on and so forth. So this uh, social intelligence is very important. Social intelligence also is very uh, uh, important in the sense that if you can combine two, uh, 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 two activities together, then you may get a multiplier effect. For example, if I grow a uh, a, a, a fruit orchard, uh, a, a, a grow fruits and uh, the flowers bloom, the bees come and uh, they take the honey. And if you can create a neighbor or a neighboring plot where these bees can come and uh, uh, you know, build a bee, bee hive, then you will get honey also and you will get also the, the, the agriculture to be promoted by the, or the activities of the bee. So this is what is called as complementarity uh, in economics, and this is something that we need to do so that we don't we, we maximize the use of whatever is available to us by nature. So this is the social intelligence. Then there is something called moral intelligence, which means that you function in a way by which you do not do immoral things to get ahead. Unfortunately, that's exactly what is happening. Uh, all this corruption, all this uh, loot and all is because we don't have this concept of morality. That you must not uh, ruin the country in order for you to come forward. So the ability to um, uh, interact uh, is something which is uh, very, very important and that should be such that you may compete with somebody, may try to get ahead of somebody, but you don't do it by harming uh, that person. Uh, or cheating that person, or uh, using the powers of the state to put him out of action and out of competition. So this, this, this is a, uh, um, a fourth thing that uh, what we call is moral intelligence. The fifth thing is called spiritual intelligence. Spiritual intelligence is something which now is mind-boggling for people to think about, but it's slowly being accepted. It is believed that, and it was believed by Shankaracharya and all the people uh, who, who became later as his as chelas, that all the knowledge is in the uh, in the um, biosphere that is that cover that uh, that area surrounding the earth, and uh, if you are able to train your mind, and that is why these shlokas are so important so that your brain you know, has a wireless communication with the cosmos. That is where you get the maximum 
knowledge you can uh, download the knowledge from the uh, from the uh, from the outer space so this is something this is being developed in the united states in a big way and the chinese are also doing it but we are not doing any research in it even though we had earlier on formulated this concept uh, when our all this all these uh, great thinkers uh, used to meet uh, we did it we are, we have done practically everything which used to now being attributed to newton and uh, uh, german uh, scientists like leibniz and so on for instance calculus calculus was invented in india and uh, in fact there is a, a manuscript i've seen called vimana shastra and i was surprised to see it there they are describing how to fly up uh, build a plane and what is the fuel they are suggesting mercury so i asked a scientist that can mercury be a, a, a fuel for an aeroplane in the future he says it's a long time in the future but it is something that is being studied when you say that uh, rama came back to ayodhya on that pushpak viman and it, the uh, the uh, ramayan text itself says that the fuel was uh, mercury today you can imagine we have forgotten all about it even the world didn't know about it it's only now in the research say so in that sense the spiritual uh, thing is very very important and particularly the fact that if your mind can connect with the cosmos then that is where this all this japam you do in the morning all the prayers you do in the morning all these are aimed at making your mind connect with the uh, with the outer space so we will become a new kind of human being so these are some of the things there are other uh, um, intelligences also like environmental intelligence uh, and so on but they the these main five can shape a new indian and that new indian can then be they can lead the country to become a vishwas guru where everybody will come running to us to learn like they are coming running to sit with our gurus here uh, you go to any of the our sadhus and sanyasis who have got some reputation you will find lots of foreigners wanting peace how to get peace and they are being taught how to get peace so the same way you will find in all these other areas also we will be able to attract the whole world the world and a large country like ours becoming a vishwa guru is something that is in the is very much within our reach and this question is how we reach out to it thank you very much dr swami i think you spoke more like a professor you gave all the various parameters of becoming a vishwa guru from spirituality to economics and what not but you are the only propaganda sorry i won't use the word propaganda you are the only propag propose the word that we are a hindu nation there is a contradiction between holistic inclusive development then hindu rashtra if hindu rashtra you want to call yourself which you are convincing all over the country you are going as a more like a hindu monk rather than a, you are wearing a saffron even now th- there is a contradiction that hindu rashtra can be accepted as a vishwa guru or not if you go by history we are hindus uh, as hindus we made the progress and nobody else made the progress we made and most of them in, uh, copied us in the beginning and then after suppressing us they made whatever progress they made i won't go into the question of hindu is it's not a religion that we are talking about it's a way of life it includes religion it's not just a way of life we say all religions lead to god is there any other religion in the world which says all religions lead to god only hinduism says all religions sarva dharma samabhava and it's there in our uh, constitution also so why should anyone object to and we are 80% the so, uh, india india in population uh, is 80% hindu and we separated uh, 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 you know partitioned our country so that those who didn't want to live with hindus could have their own country which is pakistan because they're not making a very good job of running a country 
and we may have to take it back one of these days because they're <laughs> not in a position to do it. But the fact is, Hindus are the most known, I mean, I'm not talking about riffraffs and kundas and thugs and so on who have to be dealt with in a very strong way. But internationally, nationally, Hindus are the most tolerant people if you are a genuine Hindu. Professor, I'm, I'm a little confused about it because I've been raising this question for many years in my mind. Hindu way of life or Hindutva, Hindu Dharma is the ancient, which is not known. I'm a little worried why it was known as Bharat and not Hindu. Ah, of course. So, what is the difference between Hindu Stan, which, which was the Urdu yeah. mixing or that? No, no, there's no Urdu. Why we there. still call India that is Bharat? Why is not call it Bharat, uh, uh, which means Hindu? I'll give you a, a shloka from uh, Rig Veda, which says that he from Hindu uh, Himalaya and Hindu from Hindu Sagar, what lies between is what is called as Hindustan. It's, uh, it's you know, this, all this that uh, the Arabs brought this word or the, um, uh, they couldn't pronounce uh, uh, Sindhu river, so they called it Hindu river because they, instead of sir, they use her. They, all this is but nonsense, you see. What is the difference between Bharat and uh, Hindu, Hindustan? The difference is that Bharat is the concept of our republic. And we've given the name of a king who first brought this whole idea that my children need not become kings. If you find the best person better than my children, then they become kings. And so he himself chose somebody who was not his, his child and made him a king. So we have named the country as, a, uh, as Bharat in honor of him and to represent the concept of a republic. Whereas Hindu and Hindustan is the, it describes the nation as a people, that these are the people with these beliefs. And these beliefs uh, are, are of course multidimensional, but they are beliefs in which we also say that all religions lead to God. Sarva Dharma Sabha It's there in the constitution. I'll ask you the last question before I disperse. Uh, do you think the Vishwa Guru concept which your party is talking about, you're still a member of the BJP, I assume so. Generally. Well, I'm a member of the BJP till you throw me out and I don't. <laughs> so, uh, and you won't be able to. No, I am Because my to. support is uh, very, very solid. So, I'm asking your support is to the you, cause. Your you, cause. You, you are only, uh, you know, uh, infatuated by the individuals <laughs> in the party. So, I'm not. So I'm talking about Vishwa Guru, the concept they are talking, the party is talking. That we Party is talking of whatever Mr. Modi says. They don't apply their mind. The crowd that uh, is surrounding Modi. They are linking it with, the indi with an individual. Vishwaguru that Yeah, you know, that's that wrong. It is, it's is—it's got nothing to do… The concept of BJP is It has got nothing to do with the, the individual. It is a concept, as I told you, uh, of what we are. It's not a question of who Modi is. That's not got nothing to do with it. Well, flatterers are there who will do this and Modi would be making a mistake if he thinks that he can uh, run the party or uh, take the country forward based on uh, people who are mediocre because he has chosen his cabinet also on the basis you know, of mediocrity. From the, he has implemented the Hindutva agenda. He has got the three... No, he has implemented. He's got the Ram no, Mandir no, going no, no, on. No, 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 no. I'll 56, stop you here. 370. He, he opposed um, Ram Mandir till the end. He got his friend uh, Mr. Guru Murthy or his is Chela, Mr. Gurumurti, to even present a petition while I was arguing in the court that the land which Narsimha Rao had nationalized so that we can build a big Ram Mandir, that land should be returned. It was rejected by the Supreme Court and they never got any publicity. On Ram Setu, it has to be declared as a national heritage monument. 
every day every week i have to go to the uh, supreme court supreme court then ask the, the solicitor general he says oh we are working on it we are working on it therefore last 8 years he has not done but it but the no, wait a minute wait a minute all the temples of uttarakhand were nationalized by uh, by the uttarakhand uh, uttarakhand uh, bjp government on the direction of the mr modi so don't say he is a hindutva man but he is the most popular among them that is a different matter you see even hitler was very popular that doesn't make him uh, make him uh, think i am saying that as far as hindutva is concerned modi's contribution is zero what do you think what what is the future of the professor swami and modi both to, together well he is a old friend of mine i know him since 19 yes uh, 1972 <laughs> when he was in the vidyati parishad you were also in the vidyati yes, parishad we were together uh, both of us <laughs> yeah that's why we quarrel uh, and uh, i have no uh, personal uh, differences with him but i am against the policy to keep silent on china i the economic policy is a complete rubbish i have written it to him and sent it to him why it will not work you may say india is uh, a world leader 6.5% you will say it before the budget starts at the end of the budget you will forget what you said and you will uh, give a new number i can tell you if you want to see the the, the true statistics the gdp which was at 8% in 19 uh, uh, 2015 has come down every year and today if you take the average between uh, nine, uh, uh, 2019 20 to 2000 Uh, 22, 23, you will find that the graph is down. Call any economist. You call him on this as a platform and ask him to debate with me. No one will come. I'll tell you because they know what will happen <laughs> when I. So what do you see him in 2024? 2024, Modi is about 350 par. No, the what about new 24? How can I say what is going to happen 24? There are so many. actors in the bjp there's rss i don't know what they are thinking they want to also disclose it then there's uh, all these uh, bharatiya mazdoor sang and uh, vishwan duparishad and so many things you see but they will win or not huh he will win or not bjp will win that i'm 100% certain there's no challenge to bjp <laughs> but who will be prime minister i can't say <laughs> thank you very much that that bjp will decide probably exactly bjp will decide <laughs> and the bjp is modi now <laughs> that's what you say <laughs> see the ma- main problem with us is that outsiders are more psychophantic than those inside <laughs> thank you very much